pray. Jesus, we got to keep singing. You give the song, we sing it. Grant us the hope, we live it. Give us the courage. We will abide by that courage. Got to keep singing. Bless these moments in your word. We humbly pray in your name. Amen. All right. Getting ready to read something to you. But uh, the crew reminded me, hey, Dwight, you were supposed to throw to us uh, when you were standing up there for the first time in front of these empty pews. And so their cameras are all set up, and I'm not going to waste that shot. And so they're going to they're gonna throw it right now so that you know that you, you can figure out exactly where we are in this empty church. So I'm, what, one, two, three, four, five pews from, from the front row. You see that. Look it. I admit, guilty as charged. You may be guilty as charged as well. What are you talking about, Dwight? I'm talking about Wall Street Journal. Twelve days ago, they, on, the, on the technology page, they came out with this, uh, this personal technology, as they're calling this column, a piece written by Nicole Nguyen. All right? Thanks to my friend Don Wilson. I have, I have it right here in my hands. So I'm going to read a few lines. Guilty as charged? Maybe you. Let's find out. She writes, I fixated on the glow in my hand, okay? Lighting up an otherwise dark bedroom. You know what that glow is in her hand. In the past few months, after hours, screen time has become a ritual. Last night and the night before and the night before that, I stayed up thumbing through tweets, grainy phone-captured videos, posts that gave me hope, and posts that made me enraged. I felt like I needed to see it, all of it. I was doom-scrolling, doom-scrolling. This means spending inordinate amounts of time on devices pouring over grim news, and I can't seem to stop. Doom-scrolling. It's become a part of our our vocabulary in this culture now. Doom-scrolling. In fact, Merriam-Webster, the great, the great dictionary. They now have doom-scrolling on their on their words to watch list. We're all doing it. The next bad news, what is it? Doom scrolling, doom scrolling. We do it. What say the authorities? Uh, So here's a Mary McNaughton Castle. She is professor of clinical psychology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She says, that's why we seem predisposed to pay more attention to, to negative than positive things. Doom scrolling. She goes on. Look. That's why I I always recommend that people consciously regulate their media intake. A little bit of counsel for you and me in this time of doom. You can't save other people from drowning if you're having trouble swimming yourself. Well, she's right. Doom scrolling. We all do it. And why wouldn't we do it? Look at the world. Look at this brave new world that we're about to emerge into over the next few days. Doom scrolling. Are you kidding? Pandemic. COVID-19. Global. Local. Anybody know? Is this, is, this thing, is this thing going up? Is it going down? Nobody knows. Doom scrolling. Talk about our economy. The chaos of a roller coaster. Nobody knows. You want to talk about this racial fracture that grows wider by the day and night? Doom scrolling. You know what? I'll bet you that if they had Wi-Fi on the ark, Noah and the family would have been doom scrolling because that's all it was, bad news back then. I want to go to that story. Everybody loves the story of Noah and the ark. Let's go there. I'm grabbing my Bible. You've got your Bible not too far from uh, this live screen, live stream screen. So find Genesis, Genesis chapter 8, and I'll be back in, in my new international version. Come on, follow along. We're going to spend a few minutes here in this very familiar story. We're going to go right to the middle, the very middle of the flood. Intriguing line. Here we go. Genesis chapter 8. We'll pick it up in verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Wow. I love that line. God remembered Noah. Just when you're convinced he's forgotten you, God says, no. I remember you. In fact, this word, the Hebrew word here, is used a little later in the Bible. We go Genesis, Exodus. You go to Exodus chapter 2. It's used right there at the end of chapter 2 where it says, uh, let let me read it to you here. 
I got to scribble down here. And God heard their groaning. Okay, so the children of Israel, they're enslaved now. And God heard their groaning. The King James reads, and God heard their cries, and he remembered them. Same word. But God remembered Noah. But God remembered the children of Israel. But God remembers you. But God remembers me. Did you think he was going to forget, forget us? Never. Although you got to admit, for some of you, this pandemic could not have come at a worse time. You were just, you were just rounding the curve. It looked like everything is going to be fine at last. Boom. The bottom drops out. Truth of the matter is, some of you have had a battle on your hands. You're warring against an enemy. Let's talk about COVID-19 for a moment. And I, I, I hope I'm not misunderstood when I say this. We really have been blessed. I'm talking about our little community right here. We have been blessed by somehow dodging, as it were, the COVID-19 bullet. I'm not saying nobody's been touched by it, but relatively speaking, you look at our little community. We can, we can commiserate, and we do, with those who suffer, and they still do. But we're quietly under our breath praising God, saying, thank you. you we, 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 we think we got through. And of course, the big uncertainty is nobody knows, is it coming back again? But we tend to forget that COVID-19 is not the only killer disease that stalks the land. Some of you, just thought of you a moment ago, some of you have been battling that enemy, or whatever they, the name that enemy has. You're battling for your life. Nothing's changed. Brave new world, you've been living in it. But for some of you, I suppose it is excusable indeed to come to that moment at, in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day when you say, my Lord, you have forgotten me. Look what's going on in my life. Where have you been? Don't you remember me? No, we need this line. We need Genesis 8, verse 1. It's in the middle of the flood. And the word reads, but God remembered Noah. He remembers you. He remembers me. Read it again. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now get this. There are still 150 more days to go, plus another 40, plus another 7, plus another 7. Noah's halfway through the flood. It's not like he's just they're getting ready to throw the doors open. No, he's, he's still locked down. How many days has it been for you and me? Well, here's what we know. We know that on uh, March 15, the students left this campus. They had a big chapel on uh, Thursday. Friday, everybody's gone. Just like that. We're in this church, March 16, empty church. And here we are, how many days later? Here we are, 96 days and nights later. And we'll go 21 more days, three weeks from today, until Ju July 11. So you add 96 and 21. Still looks like Noah has his beat. He knows a little bit. He knows a little something about being locked down and then the doors open to a brave new world. Because when they emerge, as we are going to have to emerge, we cannot stay locked up forever. When they emerged, as we are beginning to emerge, it is a brave new world that greets their eyes. Not unlike ours. So I, got, so I have this bulletin. It's called a bulletin. I don't know how it came to our house. I mean, look at this. ARP, A-A-R-P bulletin. It must be a gift subs subscription that somebody gave to us. Why would it be coming to our house? <sighs> anyway, as long as I have it, I might as well talk about it. This is the latest issue, June 2020. And, uh, oh, phew. it's somebody else's name on this. <sighs> that had me worried. It's somebody else who lives in that house. I'm not going to give her a name. I have to be very nice because after this live stream, I have to go home and get in the house for dinner. So anyway, uh, I'll show it to you. I'll, I'll read it right off the screen. The new normal. You see that there? How the con coronavirus is redefining life for older Americans. This is, not a, this is not a magazine for children. It's for older Americans. American Association of Retired People. All right. So they, so they, they, they have this little spread here. What comes next? And I'm not going to read all these bullet points, but there's just a few that we just remind ourselves. This is a brave new world we're heading into. 
Indeed, Americans will be increasingly fixated on washing away deadly germs. If sneezing into your elbow took some adjustment, brace for what's on the hygiene horizon, especially for older people, quoting a physician, Johns Hopkins, uh, especially for older people, hand scrubbing, mask wearing, and hyper attention to surface disinfection will be the norm at every turn. What we're going to be doing here between services beginning J July 11th, you're gonna be, we're having to do that. Everybody's having to do that all day long. So speaking of elbows, did you, I saw this little cartoon about a mother. She, so she's sitting down with her children. She says, all right, boys and girls, uh, we're going to have supper now. Has everybody washed their elbows? Come on. That's a brave new world we're in. So they said, yep, hygiene is going to be what we're living with. Here's another one. Oh, the mall, the morning newspaper, dinner, a night on the town. COVID-19 has put them all on the endangered list. And guess what? They're, they're expecting 15,000 more sto stores to, to close. Some major chains have already shut down, as you and I know. A brave new world. It won't be the same. No, no, no. Here's another one. Take me out to the crowd. Not now. It's quoting, uh, quoting the executive director and publisher of Sports Business, Business Journal, I don't see any timeline where athletic events have fans packing the stands. No, it's not going to happen. Maybe 25% in those massive stadiums. Maybe up to 30%. That's it. That's the brave new world now. Ridership and public transportation, down. 93% down on the subway riding in New York City. Well, we don't worry about subways here. I understand that. Oh, there are more. But that's enough. What's the point, Dwight? The point is, we too, like Noah and his family, we too are going to emerge into a brave new world that is irrevocably changed. You know that? I know that. Now, you know, there's one little point that uh, this art bulletin left out. And I understand why they did, because they're not, they don't have children. Children that are in school. But the issue of education... That's a huge issue right now. In fact, in, in, in my blog, it came out Wednesday night. You get our, our uh, e-letter. And in the blog, if you read it, you know that I made this statement. I am convinced that our educational leaders in America, probably globally, our educational leaders are facing the most daunting challenge of all across this nation and right here at home. They're, they're facing a challenge nobody else is facing. It's not the same. You can't say, well, it's just like the hospital. No, it's not the same. It's different. You want to think about the anxious concerns they have. And by the way, we have three educational institutions in this little parish. Think about our administrators, our faculty and staff. What are they worried about? Number one, here are the questions. Will the students come back? That's a huge question. Number two, will our safety protocol work? Big deal. Number three, will our income hold? Everybody's wondering. And number four, will the pandemic recede or surge? Our educators are living with a very brave new world. And you know what? We need to be praying for them. Absolutely. We, we need to be praying for them by name. Uh, interceding for divine wisdom to guide the decisions that they're going to on the spot ha be having to make as students come back. August 24, it's coming fast. Yeah, we need to pray for them by name. We have Principal Savory. She's over here at Ruth Murdoch Elementary School. We've got Principal Leiterman. She's over here at Anders Academy. We have Principal... We have... She was a principal once at Newbold College, but she's, she's President Andrea Luxton here at the university. And they all have teams, and they all have faculty and staff. We need to pray for all of them. So it was for Noah and his family of seven as they emerge into that bright sunlight of a broken and devastated horizon. Ah, oh, what was the look on their faces? They have not seen this big a view for over a year. Okay, let's read it. Drop down to verse, uh, verse 15. Then God said to Noah, this is chapter 8, Genesis. Then God said to Noah, come, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground that Rosemary Bailey just told us about, so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon the earth. So Noah comes out, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, and it's impossible for you and me to comprehend the shock once their senses adjust, and oh, they're grateful to be alive, but of course, but the shock. Have you ever seen a bombed out landscape? I was born in Japan after the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, but I've seen those black and white photos that my dad took 
We're talking about, we're talking about an inorganic, naked skeleton of an infrastructure. That's it. Just a few. <laughs> Listen, I don't have to make this stuff up. Patriarchs and prophets. One terse sentence describing what greeted their eyes. Here it is. The earth presented an appearance of confusion and desolation impossible to describe. End quote. Confusion, chaos, questions to the max. A brave new world. But you have no choice. And what does Noah do? <laughs> He's on his face. Not weeping. He's worshiping. He is worshiping his creator and savior. And if he had known the words of Job that would come after him, it would probably would be words that he would be quoting as he worships. Naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The family of eight, they are down and worshiping. I mean, what else can you do in a brave new world but worship the one who got you to it and who now will have to get you through it. Ah, let's read it. Verse 20. Worship. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma because it's a sign of Calvary. It's a sign that God himself will pay the price for a rebel human race pleasing aroma to him. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and he said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. So soon, yeah, don't miss next Sabbath, so soon. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. A brave new world. Yeah, it's the world we live in now. We happen to be in the summer of that prediction. We're in the summer, but we know winter's coming. Yeah. Welcome to our brave new world. It's, it's the new normal of sheer uncertainty. It's always been that way for, for Jesus' friends. Sheer uncertainty. I'm talking about the intrepid Paul, the missionary. He's been arrested in Jerusalem. Uncertainty, uncertainty. On the one hand, he knows he does not want to be left in the hands of Jewish jurisprudence and jurisdiction because they've already declared they will have him executed. But on the other hand, oh, on the other hand, if he, if he appeals to Roman jurisdiction, what will that look like in the hands of the corrupt leader, Emperor Nero? A brave new world of sheer uncertainty. It was that way for Paul. It was that way for the Lord Jesus himself in Gethsemane. Talking about a new normal that he cannot decipher. Does it go this way? Does it go that way? In the anguish of his praying, on the one hand, Jesus knows, of course he knows, that his mission is to save humanity at any cost to himself. But on the other hand, there is a realization, and his being must resist the thought that that salvation will come at the price of annihilation of himself forever and ever. A brave new world of sheer uncertainty. God's friends have always lived with it. How about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Germany? Some kind soul gave me the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, titled Strange Glory, written by Charles Marsh. I read all kinds, I've read all kinds of Bonhoeffer, Bonha Bonhoeffer biographies, but this one has to rank as the best. So there is young Dietrich. There he is. He's having, he's having to measure the calculus between his own nation plunging into despotism with Hitler on the one hand and on the other hand, the untenable choice of standing by and doing nothing as Jews are slaughtered in racial hatred. The brave new world of sheer uncertainty. And what about America right now? How is... How is a godly American supposed to be thinking and living right now. I was visiting with a physician friend of mine, not a member of this faith community. We've known each other for a few years. He was right here this week. Very active in his own church. And we're talking. 
what, what, what are the options at this crisis moment in American history? On the one hand, shall we disengage with society and culture and embrace a quietism that casts our fate to the winds? We'll do nothing, whatever. What will be? Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Shall we do that? Or on the other hand, does the racial fracturing this generation has inherited become a pox on our collective soul, a plague that we proactively seek to eradicate? Will we work as hard to get rid of racism 2020 as we are working to get rid of COVID-19? A brave new world of sheer uncertainty. Look at it. Nobody's exempt. We face the choices. <sighs> the choices for America. You know what they used to call America? They called it the new world. Oh, the new world. Oh, they moved to the new world. And now along comes Antonin Dvorak. Oh, there isn't a heart that, that, that doesn't thrill with that, with that soaring, that, the, 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 the soaring high, heights of this patriotic promise. He's writing about America. And everybody, of course, loves the Largo. That's our favorite part. We, we whistle it. We know it. What's happened? Don't you wish that optimism of a century ago were still true today? Yeah, brave new world. We face a nation. We face a world now where moral courage and ethical bravery are the last resort of its citizens. They are the last resort of the followers of Jesus. But be warned if you are a follower of Jesus. John Howard Yoder, in that book of his, The Politics of Jesus, Mennonite Ethicist, I'm reading the book through again right now. He makes the point, if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to know where his social ethic ends. It ends on a cross. Weigh it carefully, that decision. I'm quoting him now, just one line. Here it is. I'm quoting. Only at one point, only on one subject, but then consistently, universally, is Jesus our example in his cross end quote. You want to talk about moral courage? You want to talk about ethical bravery? As a follower of Christ, then you have to talk about the cross of Jesus. You can't factor that out. You have to re reject, we have to reject political machinations, backroom power grabs and deals and no, 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 no. That's not the social ethic that Jesus lived. Jesus embraced social nonconformity and nonviolence. It is absolutely clear. And it took him to the cross. You ready to end up on a cross? Moral courage, yeah. That's the only way it's going to be in this brave new world if we're going to get through. Moral courage, ethical bravery. Thomas Paine, the American philosopher, the early American writer, you remember these words. These are the times to try men's souls. You got that right, bro. A brave new world of sheer uncertainty. But there's hope. There is hope. God, there is hope and a sign that God gave to Noah and you and me. Come on, let's go. Genesis chapter 9. Okay, so we finished 8. We're at 9 now. Drop down to verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. So it's good for you and me. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, verse 13, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Oh, man, when we were kids in Sabbath school, I'll bet you they still teach this as a memory verse. But it was from the old King James back then, and it went like this. I do set my bow in the cloud. You remember that line? I've never forgotten it. I do set my bow in the cloud. God bless our Sabbath school teachers who insist that our little cherubs learn their memory verses. Those will be, them, be with them for life. Don't dismiss it, Mom and Dad, when you have family worship. Well, you know, you don't have to memorize this anymore. No. No. Yes. I do set my bow in the cloud. When I was wrapping up the eight-night series from our living room to New York City, you remember we talked about that back in May, eight nights in a row. The last night is a Saturday night. This is the wrap-up night. 
just before going on air. I get a text from Claudia Solar, my uh, executive assistant, and it says, hey, did you know that we are under a tornado watch until 10 o'clock tonight? Oh, I didn't know that. What are, we, what are we gonna do? So we went on, and sure enough, boom, man, the thunderstorms rumbled overhead. Fortunately, no tornado. When I finally signed off for the last time, Karen goes out onto our deck behind the house, and she said, Dwight, you gotta come here, come here. I hurry out there, what, what, what's, what's she seen? And then, oh, in all its resplendent glory, I saw what Jana Ketz took a picture of, and I'm going to show it to you right now on the screen. Look at that. That was that night in the distance, the gray, unroaming thunderstorm. Behind us, the sun refracting in the raindrops still in the air, and there is that beautiful, beautiful rainbow. You know what? Every time you see one of those, and we're blessed to see them, God says, I want you to remember, I do set my bow in the cloud. Wow. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Maybe God has set a bow in your cloud. You say, Dwight, what cloud are you talking about? I'm talking about the cloud that's hanging over you right now. That's the cloud I'm speaking of. Seems like that cloud has stalled over your life and you're being drenched, right? Could it be God has inst installed his bow? I do set my bow in the cloud, your cloud. Ah, uh, this doesn't feel like the good news it needs to feel like until we get one more verse and then I'm sitting down. But I need you to look this up. I never knew that Isaiah talked about Noah and the flood and the rainbow. But you're going to see. I just learned it this week. And I got to share it with you before I sit down. Come on. Uh, this is Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 54. God is speaking through Isaiah. Okay, so drop down to verse 9. You want to know what the rainbow is all about now? Here we go. Verse 9, to me, God is speaking to Israel, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. Well, we just read that little story, and we know that he said, I'm putting a rainbow just to prove to you that we're never going to destroy the planet. So we have the rainbow now. We have Noah and the flood, but keep reading. Ah, it's verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken, and the hills be removed. You want to get a feel for a brave new world? You just read it. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills removed, because that's what greeted their eyes as they step out into that blinding sunlight. It's been devastated. But though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed in your brave new world, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Wow. Every time you say, I do set my bow in the cloud. Every time you see that rainbow, I want you to know that though your mountains and hills have been shaken and moved, and though this is a brave new world for you as you emerge from this lockdown into the life that you've got to keep living, I want you to know that my unfailing love for you will not be shaken like those mountains. Won't be shaken. I'm going to surround you. My love will hold you. Are you an administrator? wrestling over what it's going to look like, this brave new world of a new year that's just weeks away now. God's speaking to you. Yet my love, my unfailing love will, for you will not be shaken. Are you someone who battles a battle that you and God know about and you wonder if you will survive this? Yet though the mountains are moved and the hills are shaken, my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Wow. That's what the rainbow means? That's what the rainbow means for all of us who, like Noah and his family, have to walk through these doors and back out into a world, a brave new world that's waiting for us. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. The fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we're needing to make constant upgrades to our technology. So if God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, 
we invite you to partner with us. Not a single penny of your donation will go to me. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website, newperceptions.tv, or call the number, you know the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. And may the God who has blessed you continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.